much, Brother Jonathan, and good morning to every one of you. And when I say good morning, I mean it's a good one for me. I trust likewise a good one for you. In fact, every morning ought to be considered a good morning. It's a day of God's additional grace extended to us. Some words of gratitude, I think, are in order at the beginning of my message. First of all, I'm grateful to the congregation here, its fine preacher, its fine eldership, for the invitation to come. I'm also grateful for my good friend, David Bridges. He's one of our most faithful members at Ripley, and he was kind enough to come and be with me and do all of the driving. I appreciate that so much. Appreciate the good lodging that you provided for us last night and the good food that we have enjoyed. Many, many thanks for all of these expressions of your love and consideration. Today we make a study of parents and checklists. I want to divide the lesson basically into two areas of thought. I want to talk about some kinds of parents in the Bible that we do not need. That'll be on the negative side. And then some kinds of parents that we do need. That will be a positive approach. But before getting into the major point, may I say just a little bit about the beginning of the home. We read about it in the early part of the book of Genesis. In fact, the home began with Adam and Eve. Marriage began with Adam and Eve. They both were created on day number six. I never have understood how some people have come to the conclusion that Adam was made and then there was a long interval of time between his being created or made and the arrival of Eve. It's a simple process to see exactly where she was, when she was born because the Bible teaches that all things were created and finished on day number six. She was a created object or a created young lady, and therefore she was made the same day that Adam was. He first in that day, and then she in second order. And from that day onward, God has placed a great premium, a great importance upon marriage and the home. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, the 13th chapter and verse 4, how that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. At the beginning of the home, after Adam had been made, God looked down from the holy heights of heaven upon the lonely Adam, and he declared it to be his divine intent to make for Adam a helpmate, one that would be by his side not behind him as an inferior, not in front of him as a superior, but by his side, and worthy to walk by his side, and he to walk by her side. That's the beautiful beginning of marriage. Sociologists have told us for years that we cannot know anything about the origin of marriage. Well, they may not be able to know, but those of us who believe in the Bible know exactly how marriage began and how the family was formed in the very beginning of time. Now to approach the lesson from the standpoint of the negative, some kinds of parents that we do not need. First of all, we do not need the kind of parent that Cain was. Cain was the firstborn to Adam and Eve. We do not know exactly how long between his birth and the time that he married. But later on, he did marry. The Bible teaches us that he knew his wife. That does not mean he made an acquaintance with her at that moment. It refers to the intimacy that husband and wife can enjoy together. And that's the significance of the expression here. But man needed someone by his side, and God decided that he was going to make Eve. And so he removed a rib, perhaps some flesh as well, from the side of Adam and constituted or builded or made or created a woman. A woman in all of her beauty, a woman in all of her glory, a woman in all of her usefulness to the man to whom she would be married. 
And so that's the wonderful beginning that we have of marriage. But looking at Cain a little bit more in detail, many people have wrestled with the question, where did Cain get his wife? Brother Gus Nichols preached in a meeting and stayed with a farmer and his family a number of years ago. And this man was all engrossed in how Cain found a wife. Nearly every day he would say, Brother Nichols, how did Cain obtain a wife? And Brother Nichols listened to it for a few days, and he said to him one day, he said, Brother, if you would pay as much attention to your wife as you are to Cain's wife, she'd be better off, and I would be better off the rest of this meeting. I thought that was a good response from a man that I greatly loved and deeply admired. Cain evidently married a, lo- a younger sister. We do know that after Cain and Abel and Seth were born, that other sons and daughters were born to the union of Adam and Eve. And it had to be the case in the very beginning of time that there had to be marriages between people who were very close of kin. Even in the time of Abraham, he married a half-sister. Even in the time of Isaac and Rebekah and then Jacob and his wife, There was a close tie physically, by physical relationships uh, in the realm of their their marriage to each other. And so Cain became a cruel man. In fact, we read about his murder of his brother Abel. And John looks back on that in 1 John, the third chapter, how that Cain was a wicked one and Abel was a righteous one. There's a great difference between righteous Abel and cruel Cain. Cain began a lineage of people, a number of descendants that would be a curse to the world. I cannot help but wonder as we get close to the time of the flood and as God looked upon the condition of the human family and with the exception of one family, Noah and the seven that constituted his family, the rest of the people had become vile, had become violent, had become immoral, had become everything that he never intended for man and woman to ever engage in. That's uh, the the, uh, beautiful thought for us to think about, that God wants us to be good people, good husbands, good wives, good fathers and good mothers and good grandmothers and grandfathers, and even great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers. These constitute the family as we know. But Cain is remembered as a vicious person. He slew his brother in Genesis, the fourth chapter. And really, there's an expression over in 1 John 3, 12 that might carry with it the idea of slitting the throat. And that may have been the way that he he did away with with his brother Abel. Evidently, there's a great deal of jealousy and envy on his part, jealous, uh, jealous over Abel and his uh, kind of lifestyle. But we do not need parents like Cain and his family. In the second place, we do not need parents like Lot was. Lot was a nephew of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah had been so good to this young man Lot He had gone into the land of Palestine with them, later on into the land of Egypt, and then when they left the land of the Nile, they went back into the southern part of Palestine. And each one became very wealthy, especially in the ownership of vast herds. It reached the place where Abraham, his herdsmen, and Lot and his herdsmen were having difficulty being close together. And Abraham, being the person of great peace that he was, he suggested to Lot, we need to divide. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Now, this is not a choice of equal uh, territories. It's really a contrast because one decision would be the fertile valley of the Jordan River fine pasture land, a good place to raise stock, 
and especially the stock that Lot had. The other was a rocky region, but Abraham was willing to accept what Lot decided not to. And Lot chose the valley of the Jordan River. The Bible tells us that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And it's not long until that tent is removed into the very heart of Sodom, one of the most wicked and one of the most immoral cities that's ever existed in all of human history. And this was not a good place to rear a family. Lot was married. We do not have the name of his wife. She's remembered primarily because she was turned to a rock of stall or a rock of salt when they were fleeing the city of Sodom. But this was not a good place to rear children. Even though it was a good place to rear animals, it was not a good environment for his children. And we read about two of his daughters in Genesis, the 19th chapter, that uh, even had a relationship with their own father after getting him drunk. And each one had a child by her own father. And uh, these became the heads of the Moabite people and uh, the Ammonite people. But Lot was not the kind of man that he ought to have been as a father. Whenever the destruction was hovering over the city of Sodom, angels were sent to hurry uh, Lot and his family out of the city. Doom was right upon the city, and Lot and his family were told to get out of the city. I believe by the process of implication, we can say that some of Lot's children decided not to stay. In fact, when he approached some of his sons-in-law, they just kind of mocked him, made fun of him. And evidently, these uh, children of his, married to these sons-in-law, decided that they were going to remain in the city. I've wondered from time to time as they left the city and Lot's wife looked back, even though they had been given the clear command not to look back at burning Sodom, she nevertheless did. I have wondered when she did that, if she were thinking about the children that were left behind and the sons-in-law that were left behind. But needless to say, she became a pillar of salt, and Lot and two daughters were the ones that escaped Sodom. And then when they went into the mountainous area, this is where the two girls decided we're going to have a child by our own father. I think they knew their father well enough that if he stayed sober, he would not have engaged in this kind of act, an act of incest. And therefore, they decided to get him drunk, and each one had a relationship with their own father. The Bible teaches us that this is not the kind of father that children need in being reared. And then again, we do not need fathers today like Eli. Eli was the last of the judges, and uh, the, really the tutor of young Samuel as he was growing up in Eli's home. But Eli had a couple of sons, and these sons were wicked. They were very cruel. They were very immoral. And about all that Eli would do to Phinehas and the other one is just kind of give them a rebuke, maybe a slap on the wrist, and that was about it. And yet, he had three forms of authority within himself. First of all, he was a judge, therefore he had civil power. In the second place, he was a parent, therefore he had parental power. And in the next place, he was, uh, the high, he was a priest, and therefore he had religious power over these boys. And nevertheless, they continued in their ways of violence uh, and especially immorality. They committed adultery with the hordes of women that assembled around the worship area. Imagine turning a worshiping, worshiping area into a realm of deep immorality, adultery, fornication, and the like. We certainly do not need fathers today like Eli. Even though basically he was a good man, he certainly failed in the rearing of his sons. In the next place, 
we do not need fathers today like some of the Israelites later on were. One of the besetting sins of the Israelite people was the sin of idolatry. Even though they lived under the law of Moses and the first two laws had to deal with, with idolatry, thou shalt not make unto thee any image, any likeness, of anything that you see in the heavens, anything that you see upon the earth, anything that you might see and observe from the sea. They were warned and warned in a severe kind of way not to engage in idolatry. And yet throughout the Old Testament, idolatry is really one of the most besetting sins that were faced by the Israelite people. The various towns in Palestine had their own Baal, and therefore Baal was an object of worship, and uh, other forms of worship were, uh, were given to other gods and goddesses of that day. And yet, think how silly idolatry was. They could take a tree, they could cut it down, and they would use part of it to warm their houses, and they would use another part of the wood to cook their food, and then they would make a god or a goddess out of the third part. And that uh, shows how utterly silly and how utterly ridiculous idolatry was. In fact, the Bible talks about the fact that you make an idol. You may put eyes on him, but he doesn't see. You may put ears on him, but he will not hear you may put a mouth upon him, but he'll not speak. You may put a nose upon him, but he'll not smell. And you may give him hands, but he has no power to move those hands. In fact, if he's ever moved from one place to another place, someone else has to do it. And yet, whenever they were in trouble, instead of turning to their idols, they would turn back to God, but almost only for a short period of time. We certainly do not need that kind of uh, father and that type of mother today. And then again, we do not need the kind of fathers about whom we read in the last book of the Old Testament. That's the book of Malachi, one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. And especially in the middle part of the book, he warns the men of his time about dealing treacherously with the wives of their youth. And any of the children that were born into this kind of situation, here they had a father that didn't think enough of his mother and his own wife to treat her with dignity and to treat her as the darling that she should have been and I'm sure was. Because God took the part of the women and certainly not the part of the men. We do not need men like that as fathers, grandfathers, and so forth. We need men who will be more like Malachi, men of God, men of righteousness, men of sobriety, men of, of godliness. Uh, Paul makes mention of these three forms of lifestyle in Titus 2, 11 and 12. Grace of God hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. To live soberly means to live right with self. To live righteously means to live right with others. To live godly means to live right in the sight of God. Here we have inward living, outward living, and upward living. And that's the kind of men we need as fathers. That's the kind of women that we need as mothers. But let's step into the New Testament for just a moment or two before getting to the positive side of the study. And I enjoy the positive side much more than the negative, but both of them have to be presented in a thorough study. In the New Testament, we certainly do not need parents like we have in the Herodian family. This was one of the most vicious, vicious, one of the most violent, one of the most murderous families that has ever existed in human history. Herod the Great, as he was called, but he was not great in character. He was not great in reputation, and yet he's often referred to by historian as Herod the Great. He had a number of wives. He had a number of sons. 
and the sons did not turn out any better than Herod was. Herod became envious of two of his own sons and put them to death. He became envious of his favorite wife, and he put her to death. That's the kind of man that was upon the throne, upon the kingly throne at the time of our, of our Savior who was born in the city of Bethlehem. He was in the closing days of his life, but it had been a life that was filled with so much in the way of crime, so much in the way of heartache to the Jewish people. He knew they didn't like him, and he thought, maybe if I greatly embellish the temple, the temple that had been rebuilt by Zerubbabel five centuries earlier, maybe that will endear me to the Jewish people. And even though he spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time in embellishing the temple of his day, it still did not change the basic Jewish attitude of hatred for Herod the Great. But he had some sons, and one of them was Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas married Herodias, and what a team of unrighteousness they were. In fact, John told Herod Antipas, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Seemingly, there were two different Philips who were in the family of Herod. And he had gone to Rome, Herod Antipas had, and he and Herodias fell in love evidently with each other, and he decided to take her from Rome and take, him, take her back to Palestine. John, in his clarion way of presenting messages, said to the king, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Well, if Herodias had had her, had had her way, John would have been killed right there on the spot. But at this time, Herod had a little bit of respect for John. He heard him often, he heard him gladly, and he refused to have him put to death at that time. But when there was a birthday celebration for Herod Antipas, uh, the daughter Salome came in and danced before the group, pleased Herod, no doubt the other men as well, no doubt a very immoral kind of dance. And so he promised, up, he promised her up to half of his kingdom. And she went to her mother about the matter, what shall I ask? And cruel and insensitive Herodias said, have him give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And this little girl, or this girl, Salome, evidently didn't flinch about the matter. She went back to her stepfather and said, give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. And even though Herod regretted having to do that, nevertheless, for his sake, as the Bible teaches, and for the sake of the people that were with him, he sent word for John to be beheaded. We certainly do not need fathers like this. And there were others uh, of the Herodian family. For instance, there was Archelaus, and he ruled in the time of Joseph and Mary when Jesus was very young. And a little bit later on, there was a Herod Agrippa, really Herod Agrippa I, and he's the one that put James to death in Acts the 12th chapter. He put James to death and would have done the same with Peter, but the Lord stepped in and saved the life of Peter. That's the kind of children that this wicked man, this wicked monarch had in his family. And as we trace down each one of the descendants, I guess there's only one of the number that I even have an ounce of respect for and that would have been Herod Agrippa II, the one that uh, Paul preached to in Acts the 26th chapter, and the one who said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He appears to be a little bit higher in character and reputation than the other members of his family. We certainly do not need parents like that. And we do not need parents who will forsake their wives and break up the home, and that was sometimes done in Bible time, and it's a very common occurrence in our day and time. But for the last part of our lesson, I want to talk about some kinds of parents that we do need, that the world needs, 
and that the church certainly needs. First of all, we need fathers like Seth. Seth was the third born child of Adam and Eve. Cain first, Abel next, and then Seth. We do not know a great deal about Seth, but uh, a little bit later on we'll find a division, the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. And it's generally believed that the sons of God came partly from the Seth line. I know there are several different, uh, several uh, generations between the two of these, but evidently Seth set a good example. And then, speaking of that general period of time, we need fathers like Enoch. We don't have a great deal of information, I think about 12 or 15 verses altogether, primarily in the book of Genesis and the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and then Jude has a couple of verses about him in his one chapter book. But Enoch was a descendant of Adam, in fact, the Bible says that he was the seventh one from Adam, which means that he was about three generations from the time of Noah and his family. But Enoch was a godly man. It was a time when nearly everybody had turned against God and heading for a total disaster to the entire population of the world with the exception of one family. But Enoch believed in the God of heaven in fact, he lived 365 years upon the earth, and then he did not die like other people have and will and, and do today. He and Elijah are the only ones in the history of the world that have escaped meeting the, death, uh, the physical death penalty that's been imposed upon the entire human family. And it is affirmed that at least 300 of these years, he lived and walked with God. A little girl attended a Bible class one day, and her mother asked her, what did you study about in your class today? And she said, well, Mommy, we studied about Enoch. And the mother said, tell me what you've learned about Enoch. She said, well, Enoch had a good friend, and that good friend was God and they often would walk together. And one day they had walked away from Enoch's home, and God said, Enoch, you come and live with me. And so he was translated and did not see physical death. Methuselah, who lived longest upon the earth, he has the record of longevity, but Methuselah was one of the sons of Enoch. He had some other children as well. But Methuselah and all of his other siblings never had a day but what they had a father who walked with God. We have multitudes of young people today who have never had one single day when their dads were walking with God or their mothers were walking with God or older members of the family are walking with God. And that's a great tragedy in our time. But Enoch was a great man. The Bible tells us that he was a member of the Hall of Faith and Fame, Hebrews, the 11th chapter. He was an outstanding father, an outstanding man in God's, God's early dealings with mankind. And then we need parents today like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were. Well, let me get something about Noah before I go to Abraham. Noah came before him. But we need fathers today like Noah. Whenever he was about 500 years of age, he was warned by God that I'm going to bring a great flood upon the earth. And specifications are given about the making of a great boat. And so he and his family made that great boat that we call the ark. And it was equivalent to a lot of storage room in our day. I've often wondered how in that allotted period of time they could have performed such an immense of work. But I think there's no doubt about the fact that God was with them and helped them as he does us today if we depend upon him. But Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his house. And when the time came, 
he and the family, family of seven, went into the ark, and they took uh, the animals that were going to be survived and keep the population of the animal world in line after the flood was over. And then came the flood. Forty days and forty nights it rang. And then that mighty boat was lifted up, and uh, all these people were saved on the inside. I heard an atheist uh, a number of years ago who made fun of that. He said the Bible teaches that Noah made an ark and that it was actually above any of the mountains. He said, you take a mountain top like Mount Everest, and if that boat was on the top of a, a, a water that was uh, 14 or more thousand, 14,000 or more feet, uh, how it would have been frozen on the top. And how in the world could that boat have flown? Well, uh, he failed to realize that regardless of how high the flood came, the cooling or the cooling section was lifted above it. I think it would have been interesting if uh, a gospel preacher had been able to say to Ingersoll, who was the one that lodged that and just exploded that thing in his face. And then we read about Noah and his three sons and their three wives. And so these were the ones that populated the earth. You and I are descendants of Adam and you and I plus all the population of the world are descendants and have been descendants of Noah. But again, we need parents like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is said of Abraham in Genesis 18, 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice, that the Lord may bring upon him that which he hath decided to do. That's a beautiful tribute to Abraham. In the Bible, he's called the friend of God. In the Bible, he's called the friend of the faithful. And Jewish people, Israelite people, later Jewish people, often referred to him as Father Abraham. And we have the account in Luke, the 16th chapter, of the man in torment who referred to Father Abraham, making the two requests that he did. But Abraham was a good man, a righteous man. He was not perfect. Nobody is, with the exception of Christ. But he was one of the most godly men in all the history of the world. And he was interested, deeply interested, in the salvation of his family. I heard of a young preacher one time who was greatly critical of Noah. Only saved, saved seven other souls beside himself. Older preacher called him aside and said, Young man, don't ever call Noah a failure. If you and other men can be responsible for saving yourself and seven others, there's no failure in that kind of endeavor at all. So we need fathers like Noah. We need fathers like Abraham. Isaac is recognized as a man of peace. And look at the job that he did with Jacob, he and Rebekah. Esau did not turn out too well, but nevertheless, there was great success with Jacob, especially in Jacob's life. And then Jacob, I think about Jacob and his favorite wife, Rachel. And to that union was born Joseph and later on Benjamin. Uh, Rachel will, give, will die in giving birth to, ben, to Benjamin. But nevertheless, they, de, they reared a, a young boy, Joseph, who has become one of the greatest heroes in all of the Old Testament. In fact, he's one of the best men, I think, that we read about in the Old or the New Testament either. And then again, we need fathers today like, uh, <clears throat> uh, we need fathers today, let me refer to some in the New Testament. We need fathers and mothers today like Zacharias and Elizabeth. Now, we don't learn about this couple in Matthew or Mark or John, but we do read about this couple in the early part of Luke, the first chapter. He was a priest, and they both were quite old. They never had been blessed with a child, even though evidently they had been praying for a child. 
And then Gabriel, the the angel, brought him a message that your wife Elizabeth is going to conceive. She's going to bear you a son, and that son's name will be John. And that's exactly what happens in the unfolding of Luke, the first chapter, which incidentally is the longest chapter in all of the New Testament. And so Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, it is said of them that said of them that they were both righteous and godly in their lives, keeping the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Oh, how we need fathers and mothers of whom that can be truthfully stated today. And then we need fathers and mothers like Joseph and Mary. Now, Joseph did not have any part at all in the conception and the birth of Jesus Christ. This was strictly a virgin conception and a virgin uh, birth. But they did have some other children that had uh, a number of boys, four in number, and uh, the Bible teaches that there were sisters in the family. We do not know exactly how many. But Joseph and Mary provided the very home in which our Lord grew up in Nazareth of Galilee. And I'm sure that Joseph, even though he was not the uh, fleshly father of Jesus as he was the other two, I'm sure that he was good to Jesus and an able leader in the family. We read something about their faithfulness in attending worship in Luke, the second chapter. We need fathers and mothers like Zacharias and Elizabeth were. But again, we need mothers today like Eunice or Eunice and Lois. They were the mother and grandmother, respectively, of young Timothy, Eunice being his mother, Lois being his grandmother. Paul makes a great, or presents a great tribute to these three in 2 Peter, or rather 2 Timothy, and he referred to the fact that your grandmother Lois had an unfeigned faith. Your mother Eunice had an unfeigned faith, and I'm persuaded that it's in thee also. Here are three generations characterized by an unfeigned, that is a genuine faith, a sincere faith, no hypocrisy, no make-believe about that kind of faith. It's a real genuine kind of faith, and that's the kind that that, that uh, Timothy had as he was being reared. And then we need mothers today like John described in one of his short epistles, the second, uh, second epistle that he wrote. And she's simply referred to as the elect lady and her children. Nothing is said about the job that her husband might have been in the process of rearing of the children, but John pays her a great compliment that her children were walking in the truth. And John was especially proud of them, using pride in the right sense of the term. And I know the mother was also. We need mothers of that kind today. We need mothers and we need fathers that will be righteous. We need fathers and mothers today that will set a good example and then back it up with teaching. It is said of Jesus in Acts 1.1 how that he did and then taught. The former treatise of our made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. He was a doer and a teacher. That ought to be the order in our rearing of our family. Doing, setting the proper example, and then teaching the person what he or she ought to know. We need more mothers like that. We need fathers and mothers today who will provide a religious atmosphere, a religious environment for the rearing of their children. Fathers and mothers ought to be in the lead. It never has ceased to uh, really amaze me when I see uh, maybe a man drive up in a truck and uh, the wife gets out and the children get out and he drives on home and then picks them up at the end of the service. He's not the kind of father that those children need. We need fathers and mothers who will not curse before their children. We need fathers and mothers who will not drink. 
who will not bring alcoholic beverages into the home. Some people seem to have the impression I can't get through life without strong drink. Well, I'm now close to 88 years. I would not know how a little bit of beer would taste at all. I had a father and mother who never brought that into our home, and they would not allow us to engage in that kind of thing. When I was in high school, I was, I was invited by one of my classmates to attend a beer party. I said, no, I'm not going to come. And I stood by that, and a great deal of that is to the credit of a godly mother and a godly father. But we need fathers and mothers today who are on their way to heaven and they are determined to take their children with them. As a father, as a mother, as a grandfather, as a grandmother, as a great-grandfather, great-grandmother, and that would be inclusive of, I think, people, most people in this audience today, I bid you the very best of God's blessings in the wonderful roles that you fill in the life of a child. Children are so precious, they're so sweet, and they deserve the finest of training and the finest of example. Thank you for your excellent attention.